So imagine that you are in a, the, the foyer of a concert hall and uh, perhaps you've been dragged there by a parent, maybe you're just a kid, or perhaps you're the parent who's done the, tr the dragging, or perhaps you're just there with a, a peer, a friend, and you're both super excited to be there. Um, what's happened is the ushers are telling you to come into the auditorium, so you're going into the auditorium, you take your place, um, and at some point you begin to read your program notes and it tells you what you, you have to expect. You should, you should, there's going to be compo uh, compositions from Bach, uh, straight through to uh, modernist composer Webern. And so that's all very interesting and exciting. Um, at some point, your attention is drawn to the stage, and there you see that the concert master has invited the oboe to play a note. Um, and the oboe's uh, note has been followed by the woodwinds, and then the brass, the rest of the brass instruments. And before you know it, slowly but surely, all the instruments are playing the same note. It's 440 hertz. It's uh, what we call A in, uh, yeah, in the music Western tonal system. Um, and what happens, the conductor comes in to a round of applause and then there's a general hush as you wait for the music to start. So I started with this scenario because um, I thought it highlighted quite early on already just how many things can influence how we perceive music. Take for instance the fact that you are um, in a, an auditorium, so it's a live performance, you aren't just listening to the music, you're also um, watching it being performed and we know um, that you know, actually, this can have a huge influence on how we actually um, hear the music or you know perceive the music. Um, another thing to consider is that you've been reading about uh, the music you're about to hear. You know, who, um, from who it you know who was composed by. Perhaps you've also been told what to listen out for while you're listening. So again, you have this top-down information, which we know um, from research can really influence how you receive the bottom-up information, which is what's actually coming in uh, into your ears. Um, but I'd like to start um, and by sort of focusing on something that's even more fundamental than, you know, what's coming in, you know, through your eyes and, you know, what you've read about the music you're about to hear and talk about actually why the, the uh, performers actually chose to go through the whole process of tuning their instruments. And you might say, well, it's just so that they they play in tune, but it just reminds us actually that there's a huge organizi organizing principle in music, which is that we use uh, very specific frequencies out of all the possible frequencies we can use. And that brings us to the notion of a tuning system. So a tuning system is basically a system that you know tells us, defines how we should select specific frequencies out of all the possible frequencies we, we could use. And in different cultures we have, we, different tuning systems, most of them revolve around this notion of octave equivalence. And that's just generally the notion that two pitches are an octave apart if they have a frequency ratio of two to one, um, and also if they sound similar, the same. And actually what happens across cultures is people take a, an octave and then they split it in different ways. In the Western tonal system, we split it into 12, and you have you know, 12 notes making the chromatic scale. Um, in other cultures, like uh, gamelan music in Bali, um, it's actually split into five or seven. Um, and what happens is when you listen as a, a, you know, a, as a person who's enculturated to one or the other system, um, it's quite your system, what you're used to hearing seems you know, perfectly logical. And when you, but when you listen to uh, tu another music in another tuning system, it might sound a little bit uh, foreign or exotic. And that's already going to influence very much how we perceive music, what tuning system has been used to actually um, uh, compose it. Another important principle is that of tonality. So I sort of threw in the fact that you might be hearing compositions from Bach through to Weber. And the emphasis here, or what I was trying to allude to, is the fact that you had, you, you're going to be listening to compositions from the 1700s and ones in the 1900s. And basically what happened in the 1900s is that um, the, the, these composers often decided to um, not stick to tonality. So what is tonality? I talked about tuning systems. Tonality is basically the fact that within all the pitches that we decide we can play music with, um, you can still compose music such that, you often compose music such that it only takes a, a selection of those um, pitches once more. So there's a hierarchy of pitches that are used to compose the music and the idea is that compositions revolve around a, a tonic, a sort of central tone, and lots of musical cultures um, um, exhibit tonality in that they revolve around a central tone. But again, how you know these tonalities look across different cultures can be very different and like I said even within a culture some people some composers choose to use it others don't what it means is that your perception of a, a composition that was 
you know, tonal is very different to one that um, isn't tonal, uh, because in one case you can make predictions as to how music is going to unfold, because you already have this hierarchy, in another case you can't. So having introduced this idea of tonality and uh, tuning systems, I'd like to now, uh, <laughs> um, much later, actually volunteer or sort of give a definition of music perception. And music perception has been defined as just uh, the process whereby we sort of organize, identify, sort of um, try to um, uh, interpret musical information so that we have a representation of it and that so that we actually reach some sort of understanding of it. And um, it happens on a range of different uh, time scales. So we're listening to music now, but we're also sort of still listening to the same music you know, tens of minutes later sometimes in the case of, you know, uh, you know, multi-movement uh, composition. And so what's interesting for researchers is to try to understand um, music perception at all these different timescales. So for instance, you might uh, care about uh, what's happening on this, you know, scale of like hundreds of milliseconds. What can we actually do with that information? Well, we can decide whether what we're hearing is a, a violin or a, f a flute. Um, and that's because um, we, psychological research has shown that there are different, you know, we have these dimensions that we use to try to distinguish between these, in, you know, instruments. Um, one of them is the attack time, so how quickly the note um, reaches its full intent. An instrument, um, uh, when you play a note with an instrument, how quickly it, it reaches the full intensity of the sound. Um, and so in the case of, let's take a piano, for instance, it has a very short attack time. You hear it, it gets loud very quickly, and then it sort of uh, recedes again. Compare that with a flute, where it takes a while to build up to its full intensity. Those two things, th that, the, the length of the attack time actually allows us to dis distinguish them. Something else that allows us to distinguish them is basically how, um, how much energy there are in the um, higher frequencies of the sound. It's worth mentioning that any given, any natural sound actually has a fundamental frequency, the lowest, and also a, a range of other frequencies what are called partials above it. And depending on how much energy, how intense the, um, those sounds are in the higher frequencies, uh, uh, an instrument can sound brighter or less bright. And again, we can use that to determine whether we're listening to this one instrument or the other. So that's kind of happening very quickly, actually. Um, but of course, we're also, when we're perceiving music, we're also um, picking out things like melodies, and that may take place over a few seconds, you decide that this is a melody. Um, and how do we represent that? Um, we don't just memorize pitches and say, oh, that's frequency 440, 466. Rather, we extract often just relative pitches and the contour. And so what we care more about is whether the melody goes, you know, notes go up and then down and then up again and then down for a long time, etc. So the idea is once we have that representation, we can use it as a template um, or something important with which to sort of keep processing the music that we're hearing and so we have attention and memory processes coming in when we start to um, try to make sense or perceive music's uh, long-term structure, large-scale structure. Um, in terms of the methods that we can use to try to understand music perception, um, basically there's, there's a whole range. Um, um, you could say well I'm just going to do behavioral studies and ask people to tell me what they hear uh, you could decide to do neuroimaging studies, of course, and try to see what's happening in the brain when you're manipulating certain features of the music. Um, but there's a whole bunch of others you can, you know, approaches you can take. You could say, well, I want to carry out cross-cultural studies because I care about how being enculturated in, in a tonal system, for instance, um, influences how you then perceive this given sound. So if we take two people, different uh, uh, cultural uh, backgrounds, they've been enculturated to different musical schemes, how do we, how do they process this differently? Um, and that can be very enlightening. Um, you could also look at um, study infants or children, and why might you do that? Well, you want to see how musical perceptual abilities develops over the lifespan, and that's how we know, for instance, that a sort of sense of tonality, those rules guiding tonality, start developing in children about four to seven. Um, they start in th before that, they're actually quite open and they are actually better at um, adults at lots of things. Um, but then you could also use study you know, across species, and that's, for instance, how we know that Octave, equi octave equivalency, this thing that we have where we sound, we think two notes sound the same if they're an octave apart, frequency ratio of twos to one. Um, that, that's how we know that rats and actually monkeys have the same um, ability. And so I guess you could say um, that research into music perception can really be approached um, from a whole bunch of different perspectives. And uh, part of the interest is actually having bringing together all of these perspectives to try to understand how it works in, in general. Here's uh, some work I was uh, doing a few years ago. It was looking at um, 
um, individuals with a disorder known as congenital amusia. Now, these individuals will show difficulty um, uh, yeah, recognizing that that song I'm singing or maybe humming is Happy Birthday. Now, m most of us know the tune Happy Birthday. We've been hearing it since we were one, perhaps. Um, but these individuals will have difficulty with that. And so um, we carried out a, you know, a series of studies to try to understand why that might be, why they have these difficulties. And um, just to give an idea of what we found, well, the first question was, do we have difficulty learning? Um, do they have difficulty, rather, learning the structure of uh, the tonal system that you know, they should be exposed, that they've been exposed to? Um, what we found out was that it wasn't that simple. They seemed to be able to learn the structure in, of tonal sequences just as well as controls. Um, we then asked, well, are they able to, um, even if they aren't able to explicitly say that they've heard, you know, a wrong notes in a melody, for instance, um, is it possible that they're implicitly processing it? And um, interestingly, what we found was that that was the case. So they were actually able to um, um, recognize implicitly that, you know, this note is more unexpected in that context than the other one in that context being the melody. Um, and then we did some um, EEG to show, in fact, the brain is tracking information that they can't consciously um, um, report and so we found out that there was this sort of um, um, yeah there might be the disorder might be one of uh, you know conscious awareness of the information that they actually do have but you know that sort of question then opens up a whole new bunch of uh, of questions which in the end I guess yeah you have to decide what you study at any one time but in terms of uh, sorry I think I guess in terms of the broader question of are there any, you know, any um, outstanding questions? I guess it depends on where you decide to focus. So I already said how many different approaches you can use to study music perception. Um, those people who are working on, you know, looking across species will have, you know, tons of questions within that. Um, I'm currently working a lot on um, emotion and music induced emotions and basically um, there with every um, experiment that I carry out, there's you know, five different follow-up experiments that I need to carry out to satisfy my curiosity.